He is worthy. He's worthy of the praise. If you know he's worthy of the praise, then lift your hands and give him glory. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, we want to thank you for another opportunity to be assembled with the saints on this another Lord's day. We pray that you would just anoint these lips of clay that we might speak as an oracle of Christ and not just as a man. Hide us behind your glorious cross and cover us with your precious blood. Allow no flesh to glory in your sight. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Give God a hand of praise and you may be seated. I want to go back to the passage of Scripture that I spoke from this morning at the 8 a.m. worship. And I'm going to ask you if you would turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12. And read with me from 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9 and allow your Bibles to remain open to this chapter. If you have 2 Corinthians chapter 12, say amen. amen. Let's read it uh, aloud together. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Although I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. All right, that's where we'll stop. I want you especially to pay attention to verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, 
through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning or this afternoon, a thorn in the flesh. And uh, although we are concerned with Paul's thorn in the flesh, I think that every one of us, at one time or another, we have thought of problems that are reoccurring problems as a thorn in the flesh. And I think that all of us have them. Uh, you may not call it that, but it reacted in such way upon Paul as our reoccurring problems react upon us. A few minutes ago, I started to talk over a microphone that was dead, and I said, well, that's one of my thorns, uh, that almost every time I get ready to use a microphone, either it'll start whistling, humming, won't work at all. And anything that just keeps on coming back, keeps on coming back, you think you've got it conquered, and it just keeps right on coming back. Uh, you can call it what you want to, but Paul called it a thorn. Any of y'all ever had one? <laughs> now there has been much speculation as to the thorn in Paul's flesh. What was it? And anything that the Bible is not necessarily clear upon, and then sometimes I think the scriptures are more clear than we understand them to be. Sometimes the answer is right there, but we don't necessarily see it. And because so many people have not been able to really envision Paul's thorn in the flesh, they have gone into speculation. And when you go into speculation as it relates to God's Word, uh, you're going to add two and two and come up with five, seven, or 18. Uh, in this day when nothing is hardly regarded as being sacred. Uh, the Word of God now, you've got some folk uh, who have the concept of uh, God as being genderless. Uh, you hear folk now praying, Father God, Mother God. And many of those who are uh, devoted to what is called the empowerment of women will say that it's not right to even refer to God as a he. But certainly if God uh, is the possessor of all of the wisdom and all of the knowledge and all of the power in this world and gave to Adam the ability to name all of God's creation, then God certainly knows uh, that he wants to be regarded as he and not she. And uh, he declares himself to be the father and not the mother of creation. Amen. And uh, he's smart enough to know who he is. And I think that we ought to just leave things like God left them. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Now, I may be ruffling the feathers of some of you uh, woman liberationists, but uh, don't get too liberated. Remember that there are some things that can't be changed. You can try to make this a unisex society as much as you want to. But when you get through, sisters, you cannot father a child. <laughs> so in the midst of this confused age in which we live, some have surmised that uh, because Paul chose to not marry, that his thorn was somewhat of an unnatural love for men and a hatred for women. And they point to things like the first book of Corinthians, chapter 7 and verse 1, 
where Paul says, now concerning the things you wrote unto me, it is good for a man to not touch a woman. But Paul was not talking about this from the standpoint uh, of a personal uh, choice as it related to uh, sexual behavior. But he was talking about one desiring more to dedicate his life to God than to even uh, experience what is the normal pleasure of mankind. Paul goes further in that same seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians and he talks about how that the married cares for the things of this world. The married man cares for the things of this world, how that he may please his wife. And the married woman cares for the things of the world where as she may please her husband. But those that are unmarried and dedicated to Christ, they only think about what they can do in order to please God. But now we live in a suspicious society. They don't believe that anybody can wholeheartedly dedicate themselves to God. And if there is a man that uh, chooses to give his life as a life of service to God and uh, they can't pin him down with a woman, they're going to automatically say he's gay. And if there's a woman that wants to dedicate her life to God and not choose marriage, then they're going to say that she's practicing lesbianism. Uh, but it's best to not accuse folk if you weren't there. Amen. Uh, you know, if you're not there, then you don't know what their choice happens to be. And there are some people in this world whose greatest joy is in living to please God. And don't fool yourself. I don't care what you say. You can bring, as Paul used the word, mortify the members of the flesh. You can bring flesh under subjection to the extent that you can live for God without having to have a man or a woman. That's not normal. It all starts in your mind. And thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he what? Trusteth in thee. And, and if you center your mind on the things of God, the body falls in line. But if you feed your mind, triple X movies, if you feed your mind soap operas, if you feed, look at how y'all looking at me. If, <laughs> whatever you feed your mind before you know it, the mind is going to trigger a response in the body. I mentioned in the book of Ezekiel how that uh, Ezekiel, God showed him through a hole in the wall how that the elders of Israel, the old men, were living in the house of their imagery. They had imagination. They couldn't even carry out their imagination, but they imagined. You got a lot of folk living now in a house of imagination. <laughs> Yesterday is gone, never to come back. But they live in their house of imagery. And your mind, if you feed it the wrong thing, will mess you up. Amen. So the more I study Paul, the more I recognize that his thorn in the flesh had nothing to do with sexual preference. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following, Paul gives a more stern rebuke than any other gospel writer or any writer in the Bible against those who would practice uh, any type of homosexual behavior. So his thorn in the flesh had nothing whatsoever to do with sexual preference. Then there are some who are of the opinion that Paul's thorn was bad eyesight. You read in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11, and he says something to the effect of, see how large a letter I have written with my own hand. He even 
alludes to the fact that in writing to the uh, church at Galatia, that he is writing abnormal sized letters, which seem to have indicated that uh, he could not see too well. And if a person wanted to follow that line of thinking, all you'd have to do would be to go back to the ninth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, around verse 8, when he was converted on the Damascus Road, and when he fell from the beast upon which he was riding. When he got up, he was blind. And they had to lead him into Damascus and lead him to the house uh, where Ananias was on Straight Street. And while in the presence of Ananias, there was, as it were, scales that fell from his eyes. And some say that the blinding light that Paul saw on the road to Damascus became his thorn in the flesh. Well, when you examine all of those uh, possibilities, it is usually concluded that Paul's thorn in the flesh was not really anything physical in his body, but it was the enemies of his ministry. Paul was a great evangelist, but he had many enemies. In fact, when I read in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 24, uh, there the word thorn is used in the Old Testament, and when it speaks of a thorn, it's talking about the enemy nations that surrounded Israel. So an enemy could easily be looked upon as a thorn. There's much that we do not know about Paul's thorn, but there are a few things that we do know. Now, the first thing that we know about his thorn in the flesh is that the thorn came in the aftermath of a great spiritual experience. Look again to verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. In other words, Paul said, I had just had such a tremendous spiritual experience that if the thorn had not entered into my life, I would think that I was above other folk. And you've got to watch it when God does something for you spiritually. Uh, if you don't plant your feet solidly on the ground, you start thinking that God has put you in a class above everybody else. Amen. All the Lord's got to do is use you one time in prophecy. Amen. And every time you open your mouth, you want everybody, now be quiet. Now this is God talking. Amen. But just because God spoke through you once, it doesn't mean everything you say is from God. Amen. I remember my father used to talk about an old man uh, in the Church of God in Christ named Gus Hicks. And he said that when uh, Gus Hicks talked, he told the folk, now, sometimes when you hear me, it's the Lord. And sometimes it's Gus. <laughs> and you can say what you want to. I don't care how God use you. Every time you open your mouth, it's not God. Uh, Paul even admitted, and especially in that uh, seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians when he's talking about separation, marriage, and divorce. And he says, now, this I write by commandment. And he goes a little further and says, the rest speak I and not the Lord. He says, some of the things I'm telling you, God told me to say it. And some of it, I'm just saying it by permission. This didn't come from God. This comes from me. And we've got to recognize that it doesn't matter how many times God uses us, every time you open your mouth, it's not always God. Amen. You're still human like the rest of us. Amen. And sometimes you talk, you're talking in self. Amen, Amen like. Amen. Now, Paul says after this great heavenly experience, I could have felt like I was walking on the clouds and had just uh, joined in the citizenry of heaven. But just about time the heavenly revelation was over, 
I found myself faced with the devil. And uh, when you read the life of Jesus, uh, the gospel writers, the synoptic writers tell us about his baptism by John in the river of Jordan. And as he comes up out of the water, he's led of the Spirit. Another says the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Forty days and nights he fasted. But at the end of those 40 days, Satan showed up. And the first thing he did is said, if you're the son of God, command that these stones or this stone be turned into bread. If you're the son of God, let me show you the kingdoms of this world. And all you got to do is fall down for a moment and worship me. And you can have it all. You won't have to go by way of the cross. Up to the pinnacle of the temple, you so much God's child. Isn't it written that he'll give his angels charge over you? Cast yourself down. And the devil kept on tempting Jesus. And when Jesus rebuked him with three verses of scripture from the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible said, Satan leaveth him for how long? For a season. And don't you think that just because uh, you came off a two or three day fast that the devil is not going to bother you? Soon as you come off of your spiritual cloud, the first one you're going to see is the devil. He's going to be right there. Your thorn in the flesh to remind you that you're not in heaven yet. Uh, I'm told that during the time of the Roman Empire, that if a Roman emperor had gone off and conquered a country, conquered the king and conquered uh, the military might of that particular country, that as he rode back into Rome and amid the cheers of the crowd, crying out to him by the tens of thousands, telling him how great he was, that in the floor of his chariot would be seated a slave. And the slave would keep saying back to him, remember, thou art only a man. Remember, you are only a man. When he hears the cheers, it will make him think he's some kind of a god. So he has to be reminded that he's only a man. Our thorns in the flesh are to remind us that when we would be caught up and think that we would sail away, the thorn becomes the anchor to remind you that even though you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, hallelujah, got gifts of the Spirit operating in your life, you're still human. You're still a man. You're still a woman. And the devil is still after you. Well, as I think about Paul's thorn in the flesh and the fact that it came in the aftermath of his spiritual experience, I want to also take a look at the context in which Paul mentions his thorn. You still have your Bible open? Turn back to the beginning of chapter 11. And at the beginning of chapter 11 in the first Corinthians, Paul employs a satirical style of writing to defend both himself and his doctrine before those false prophets who would attempt to condemn him. Look at how it starts. Would to God ye could hear with me, bear with me rather, would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. In other words, he said, I know what I'm about to say. It's going to sound foolish with you, but, you know, you just bear with me. And he lets them know that my concern is because I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
He said, I'm the one that God used to preach you out of your sins. Throughout all of the area where he had gone on his first and second missionary journey, and had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and men and women had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time Paul would get to his next stop, word would always beat him there to the fact that as soon as you left town, the Judaizers came, the others came through saying that your doctrine is wrong, that what you're preaching is heresy and not truth. And Paul wanted them to know that, that I'm concerned because I'm trying to prepare you for the great marriage of the Lamb. I want you to be pure in your doctrine. I want you to know as I have preached that by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. I've tried to tell you that nobody has the power to save you but Jesus Christ. And every time I turn around, you are mixing up your Christianity with some other kind of religion. You're getting your faith confused with other kinds of doctrine. He said, and then these who come through, they try to tear me down and say that I'm not really an apostle but then they themselves are the false teachers. Look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And isn't it something how some people can be so subtle that don't even believe Jesus? Uh, and I'm thinking of a man now whose name I shall not call. And when he preaches, he doesn't even preach as much from his book as he does our book. Why? Because it's a snare to catch you. This didn't just start happening. It's been going on. There are people who will learn your Bible better than you so they can mess your mind up. He said, well, don't worry, you know, false apostles, they wrap themselves in a garment of light. That's nothing to marvel about. Look at verse 14. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If you don't believe it, go back and read the beginning of the book of Job. And it said on a certain day when the sons of God presented themselves before God, here's Satan right in the midst. Satan wasn't there to, prove, uh, to try to fool God. He knew that God knew who he was, but he was there to fool the other sons of God. So Paul goes on telling them, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now since these false teachers have been boasting about who they are, look at verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh, our glory also. They've been boasting about all of what they've done and who they are. And they've come through after I've established the church and they've told you have a little faith in them and uh, not only do they have the power to fill your teeth, but they'll fill it with gold and they've got the power to grow that short leg to where it matches the long leg. And you don't see anything they've ever done. They're just always telling you how much power they got. Paul said, well, let me do a little boasting. He said, when I start boasting, I can tell you that if they are Hebrews, look at verse 22, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers? He said, now remember now, I'm, I'm talking like a fool. He said, if they are ministers of Christ, I'm even more. I've labored more abundantly. And when it comes to suffering, 
for the gospel that I preach five times according to the Jewish customs I've been whipped hallelujah with 40 stripes save one been in prison more frequent in fear of death more often three times beaten with rods once I was stoned three times suffered shipwreck down in verse 25 a night and a day I've been in the deep I've done more traveling in the perils of water danger of robbers in danger from my own countrymen in danger from the heathens danger in the city in danger in the wilderness in the sea among false brethren he said if they got something to boast about I can boast about much more but as he comes in the chapter 12 look at it he said, oh well it's not expedient it's not really profitable for me doubtless to glory or to boast no need me boasting all of these things after the flesh. Let me bring into the spiritual realm. I'll come now to visions and revelations. And then he talks about himself from the third party position as though he's not talking about himself but speaking as an observer. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago and whether the man was in the body uh, I don't know whether he had an out-of-body experience. I don't know. And you know, we're living in a day now when you're hearing a lot about people with out-of-body experience. And the scientists and everybody, they are concerned now that when a human being dies, that that's really not the end. Because too many folk have died on operating tables. And while they were beating on them, trying to bring them back to life, the spirit was yet in the room hovering over and told them later everything that everybody did. Out of body experience. And if you think that your body is all of your existence, honey, I'm sorry for you. You are a tripartite being. And when this body dies, the spirit remains alive and moves to a higher realm. Paul said, when I had this experience, I don't know if it was an out-of-the-body experience or whether or not it was an experience that my body and my spirit shared. He said, but I want you to know that this man I'm talking about, he was caught up into the third heaven. Well, how many of you have ever been on a jet plane? Raise your hand. Well, see, if you've been on a jet plane, you've already been into the first heaven. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. That's where the birds are flying. That's where the airplanes are flying. That's the first heaven. Most of us have not been to the second heaven, but there are few who've been there. The astronauts that stepped out on the moon. Because the second heaven is the stellar heaven. That's where the stars and the moon and the orbs of light are. But the third heaven is all the way to the throne of God. Paul said, this man that I knew 14 years ago, whether it was an out-of-body experience or whether his whole body shared in the experience, I don't know. But this man went beyond heaven number one and heaven number two, went into the third heaven and heard things that it was not lawful for a man to utter. I know a little bit about what Paul's talking about. I'll never forget Sunday night, September the 16th, 1956. I received the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, but I never fell out, you know, this thing of what we call being slain in the spirit until two weeks later on a Friday night in an all-night tarot service. That was the first time I fell out and witness what it was like to be slain in the spirit. Third Sunday night in November 1956, it happened again. Third Sunday night, uh, 
third Sunday night in the December. It happened for the third time. Three times in a period of from September to December. And since then, uh, I've felt the presence of God in a lot of beautiful ways, but I haven't been slain since. But I can remember while out under the presence of the Holy Ghost that my spirit went somewhere. And I heard things that God blotted out of my mind before he brought me back to myself. And all that I knew was when I came to myself, tears were running. And I went to the edge of the pulpit and told my father that first night, that uh, uh, third Sunday night in October, I believe the Lord called me to the ministry. He just patted me on the shoulder, didn't say a word. A month later, the same thing happened, and I went over and told him, I know the Lord called me to the ministry. And he said, all right, and didn't say a word to me the rest of November and all December. And in the New Year's Eve service, just before the saints went down on their knees to pray in the new year of 57, my dad called me over and said, as soon as we get up from the prayer, I want you to give your testimony to the church. And I sat there and composed what I was going to say about God calling me to the ministry. And as I stood, something happened that I wish it did happen every time I preached. I stood up and opened my mouth, and the words came pouring out, but they never came through my brain. Nothing that I had planned to say did I say. It was like mechanical dictation. I opened my mouth, and God just spoke it through. And oh my God, I wish now I could get up and preach like that. But now I got to study and dig and struggle with you all until the Holy Ghost come. I, I wish it did happen like that night. So I know something about what Paul was talking about. He said, I was caught up and I heard things that I can't even repeat. And when this happened with Paul, I don't know. It could have happened to him when he was on the road to Damascus. When he said, as I journeyed near the city, I saw light shining above the brightness of the midday sun. And I heard a voice calling me in my Hebrew tongue and saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And God told him, go on into Damascus. Go down on straight street. There's one by the name of Ananias, and he'll tell you what you ought to do. I don't know if this was when Paul had that experience or when he was stoned and left for dead. But at some point when he was out of himself, he said, I went up. I saw things. I heard things. And because of the abundance of the revelation, I could be walking around here thinking that I'm greater than other folk. But in order to keep me anchored, in order to keep me from trying to walk by folk and not speak, in order to try to tell folk I got it all and you don't have nothing, Paul said there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. And it didn't come from God. God gave me the revelation. But what happened with the thorn, he came as the messenger of Satan. Doesn't say God gave him that. He just said it was given to me. I'm trying to tell you that whenever you are caught up in the spirit, look out for the devil. God gives you a vision and the devil is going to give you a thorn. God catch you up, but Satan is going to try to pull you down. And don't you ever think that because, oh my God, a lot of folk don't understand it. Why is it that there are problems we have in Pentecostal churches that look like they don't have no whales? Look like other folk that don't believe in tongues, speaking, everything goes so smooth. And over here where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on, you always got some kind of problem. Well, the devil will tell you, I don't have to worry about folk who don't have it. 
They don't have nothing I want. He said, but when I run up on folk that's really had a mountaintop experience with God, suddenly he wants to tear up a Holy Ghost-filled church. Suddenly he wants to destroy a man or a woman that have the gifts of the Spirit operating in their life. I don't even know why I'm preaching this today. Amen. Because as far as I know, we're not having no trouble in here, no more than normal things. But Paul says, the thorn came to remind me, oh, bless his name, that I am not to be looking at myself higher than I ought. The thorn is the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat me, and to keep me from going off course. And as I close, Paul said, I went to see God about it. I didn't go one time, but I went to him three times. He didn't operate on me. He didn't remove the thorn. All he did was gave me some medication in order that I'd be able to run on a little bit farther. You ought to touch somebody and tell them, if your thorn haven't been removed, ask God for some medication that'll help you to keep running on. <laughs> hey, glory. Paul said, I asked him to move it, but he said, I won't do it. He gave me some medication, and I was able to go a little bit further. And after a while, it got so bad, I went back and asked him a second time. He gave me medication and told me, run on a little further. But he said, I'm still not going to take the scalpel of the Spirit and remove the thorn from your flesh. Finally, on the third time, I went and said, God, I got to have some help. And he gave me medication again and said, I'm not going to move it. But all I want you to know is that my grace is sufficient for thee. Well, what do you mean grace is sufficient? What is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. So what the Lord really told Paul was, even though the thorn is in your flesh, you yet have my favor. Oh, glory to God. I don't think you got that one. So many times people want you to believe that because you are buffeted by persistent enemies that you've fallen into disfavor with the Lord. But the Lord is saying it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't mean that you have lost my favor. Enemies are all around you, but you still have my favor. Sickness is in your body, but you still have my favor. Bills are stacked up that you can't pay, but you still have my favor. Enemies are around your door and hanging your name on the highway, but you still have my favor. You ought to touch somebody and tell them, I can bear the thorn as long as I have the Lord's favor. You're walking around here with a thorn. It's like a bullet that's in a place that's inoperable. It's like the blade of a knife that got broken off near your heart and can't nobody take it out. Sometimes you have conditions and the doctor say it's inoperable. But I hear the Lord saying, even though your condition may be inoperable, I'm not going to take it out, but I'm going to let you live with it. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you peace. And every once in a while, I'll give you some pain medicine. And even though a thorn won't move, you still have my grace. Ah! Hallelujah! That's why the songwriter, as I go to my seat, sat down and penned the song one day and said, Grace, grace. 
God's grace, his grace is sufficient for me. Grace, grace, God's grace, his grace will give you the victory. Oh! Hallelujah. As long as his grace is working in my life, the enemy can roar like a lion. He can hiss like a snake. He can bark like a dog. He can meow like a cat. But I don't care what the devil does. As long as I've got God's grace, I can make the journey. Ah! From on high, let the wind blow. Let the thunder roll. Let the lightning flash. As long as I've got God's grace, I can make the journey. His grace is the fuel that keeps me going. His grace is the light that lights my way. His grace is the faith that keeps me from being defeated. Ah! sitting there with a hung down head. Quit calling for a pity party. Quit doubting the power of God. Quit doubting the favor of God. If the thing won't move and you've been praying about it 15 or 20 years, get up in power and say, I'm going on anyhow. But I feel something moving right now. You've got trouble in your home. Things are not like you want it to be. But oh, God keeps you alive. Keeps you with food on the table. Keeps you with a roof over your head. Keeps you with clothes on your back. You may not have everything you want. Look like there's a thorn in your flesh. But oh, his grace. Reach over and tell somebody, neighbor, as long as I have grace, which is God's favor, I can make the journey. Yeah. Hallelujah. Get up and give him some praise right now. Come on, praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Grace. Grace. For me, oh my Lord, grace, grace, hallelujah. Somebody say, Grace woke me up 
this morning. Hallelujah. Three people again, as long as I have grace, which is God's favor, I can make it in spite of my fall. Long as I have grace, which is God's favor. of Jesus. Come on, give God a hand to praise somebody. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. You can be seated. Glory to God. Mm. It's all right if you want to praise him.
Praise the name of Jesus. Now praise. Praise is only for people who got victory. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Let me extend the invitation. Someone does not know the presence of God's grace in your life. Grace is unmerited favor of God. Those that are saved, we know God's grace because there's no good thing that we've done. But it's the loving kindness of Jesus Christ. Someone in this building today does not know the grace of God. Lost in your sins and even right now, if you die, you wouldn't make it. Bless you, my brother. Hallelujah. You that are tired, come to the altar. That's right, my brother, come on. If you're tired of your ways, if you're tired of your sins, come on to the altar. Bless you, my brother. That's right, my brother, even in the West Queen. All God's grace is being applied this morning, that's right. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right, my brother. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, can't you see God's working in this place right now? Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Others that the Lord is speaking to. The presence of God is so great in this place right now that every sin in this building ought to make a change in your life. There's some of you who really would try to live saved, but you feel within yourself that you can't do it. And the truth of the matter is, you can't do it by yourself, but oh, with the grace of God. That's right, mother, come on. Hallelujah. Bless this mother. Others whom the Lord is speaking to. Hallelujah. Backslide of the Lord yet loves you. His grace is yet sufficient for you. Hallelujah. West wing main level as well as the balcony. The Lord is yet pleading for you to give yourself over to his will. Are you coming? Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody, that's right, my sister. Turn to somebody and tell the neighbor, it's the Lord speaking to you. Hallelujah. Bless you, my sister. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus. Don't want to close it out before you come. If the Lord is speaking to you, why don't you come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The balcony, if you just go to the elevator and press one, we'll wait on you to come. Don't want to close it out, but time is rapidly running out. Are you coming? Are you going to obey God? Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Mm. 
praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Then maybe there's someone who's already saved. Hallelujah. You want to make this your church home. You can come to the altar now also. Bless you, my sister. That's right. Amen. Brother Usher, if she's coming down here, make sure someone goes with her so she won't get lost. That's right, my sister. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Bless these that are coming. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Saints, the Lord is doing this. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Are you coming? Hallelujah. The rest in whom the Lord is speaking to, are you coming? Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm willing to wait on you. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right, my sister. Come on. From the West Wing. And even from the balcony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. That's right, my brother. Come on. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds, those, the rest that the Lord is speaking to. Just as sure as I stand here today, there are others that the Lord is speaking to. Even though this altar is full, the Lord is yet speaking to you. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. That's right, my sister, come on. That's right, my brother, come on. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Saints, can't y'all see what God is doing in this place? Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Saints, point your hand in this direction toward the altar. In the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for your favors and your grace. Lord, there are those standing here right now with problems that seem to be unbearable. But Lord, if you don't deliver, I know you're able to deliver. But if you don't deliver, give us the strength to go through. The enemy is against them and trying to destroy them. The thief cometh not but for the steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, you come that we might have life and that more abundantly. We claim victory for those that have come to the altar. Victory over anything that's not like God. Victory over drug abuse. Hallelujah. Victory over sin. And even the problems that they may have in their home. We pray right now a double anointing of your strength that right now as they go back to their homes and places of abode yes. that they have the victory in your name. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Satan, you're defeated. Yes. You have no
no victory here. Hallelujah. God, touch the altar. Consecrate the altar. Hallelujah. And everyone that responded, give them a double portion of your strength. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, I want each one of you, Elder Sigas is there, and I think Elder Askew is going also, but I want each one of you to just turn in this direction, see where Elder Sigas has his hand up there, and just follow him on down. Now, ladies, if you did not leave your purse with somebody responsible, then go back and get your purse. But if you left with somebody responsible, then just follow them right on. God bless you and you who would like to be members of our church today. We'd love to have you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, come on. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now listen, I'm getting ready to dismiss you. The women are meeting with Sister Patterson and um, all the brothers, and the brothers are going to meet with um, Brother Brooks. Now listen, let me tell you what I want you to do. As I said, those who would like to contribute to uh, Reverend Sam Ram Paul for his work in India, I'm going to ask you at this time to get that offering in your hand, and if you need to write a check, make the check payable to Temple of Deliverance. Temple of Deliverance or Bountiful Blessings, it doesn't matter. We will cash the check off. We don't want them to have to worry about having to negotiate a check. Hello? I'm going to give you just about 60 seconds to get that ready. And then what we're going to do, instead of walking to give it, we're going to pass it down our rolls, but wait for my signal. If there are those who want an envelope so that you'll have your credit, ushers, deacons, quickly give them envelopes. Now that song Elder Askew was trying to get you all to do earlier, it's a little slower. I've got the victory, hallelujah. I've got the victory, hallelujah. Come on. I've got the victory, hallelujah. I've got the victory. Oh, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess he is Lord. He is Lord. Satan is defeated. Satan is defeated. Satan is defeated. Oh, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess he is Lord. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess he is Lord. I've got the victory. 
victory. I've got the victory. Do you have it? Tell somebody, I got Hallelujah. Oh, every knee shall bow, every tongue that he is Lord. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess he is Lord. He is Lord. Now, next time y'all know that, all right? Uh, Pastor here, Pastor, Pastor Burnett, and uh, his church is what, on the base in? On the U.S. Army base in uh, Camp Doha, Kuwait. All right. Yes. Praise God. Just say a word. And Amen. Pray. Amen. First, giving all honor to God, who is truly the Lord of my life, to uh, Bishop Patterson, to the ministers on the roster, all the brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, what I wanted, my prayer request is this. Uh, first of all, Brother Paul, you're doing a fine work in India. Wanna, I want to say God speak to you in what you're doing there, brother. Because what we have over there is a, a prayer going on now. We call our 1040 window. And this is the area in the region in the East and Middle East that they are still worshiping snakes, elephants, cows, rats, idols. They're still doing blood sacrifices. And we're in uh, Kuwait, where it's an Arabic country, where Islam is prominent. And people are still denying Jesus Christ as a son of God. And so our prayer is that you will pray for us in the work that we have over there, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be spread to every nation. Amen? Praise God. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. It, it's really something how the Lord sent two witnesses our way. And that's why I keep telling you people what God has given us. And we have the name Jesus. Let him always be glorified and never compromised. Hello, somebody. And I'm saying it, I don't care how many folk outside this church or inside this church that want me to lock arms with Farrakhan. He's an antichrist. He is against Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to march under his banner and nobody else's banner that is not displaying the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. These countries, you know, people have to sneak and call on the name Jesus, and we can worship him freely. And then we're going to go around here trying to talk about for black unity. Amen. Black unity, nothing. If we want black unity, unify under the name of Jesus under the banner of the cross and march on and do what we can for our folk. And that's where I am and that's where I'll be. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand for a moment and join hands in prayer and then you're going to pass those offerings down your row in the direction of the center aisle. God, we want to thank you today for what we have heard. Thank you, Lord, for our brother Sam Rampal from India, our brother from the base in Kuwait, who know how precious is the name of Jesus. Oh, God, give to your people who claim your name. Give us a real love a real love for your name that we will never put anybody on the same level nor say it doesn't matter but let us be true soldiers of your cross and Lord there in Kuwait and in India sing your word and let a stirring come where men will begin to call on the name of Jesus 
and realize that no animal and no man other than Jesus Christ has the power to save. And Lord, every dollar that we give today, let it be used to glorify your name there in India. And our gifts multiply them and make them adequate. And then bless these, Lord, as they go on their way. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Pass those offerings down your row in the direction of the center aisle.